Thank you. Um, uh, at least I don't have a face rash, so I, d I do appear to have broken the, the AV, but it's, it's back up. So um, yeah, uh, I do want to uh, give a little warning. I am talking a little bit about mental illness, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, since bipolar disorder is in my title. 3% of the U.S. population has bipolar disorder. 25% um, of the U.S. population is suffering from a mental illness at any given time. That's not mostly what I'm talking about, but as Eva said, if you are feeling that this is a lot, feel free to uh, take a break. Um, I uh, panic a lot. Uh, I panicked when the AV wasn't working, and I panicked. I panic when I travel. And um, obviously, public speaking makes most people panic. And I once panicked about how to properly get water from a water cooler. And I don't even have panic disorder. Oh, this is me. I, we already talked about me. Um, I have bipolar disorder. Um, so for those of you who might be in the know, this is a number from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, that's, the, that's my diagnostic code. It's type two rapid cycling treatment resistant bipolar disorder. Um, I'm gonna spend like a tiny bit of time telling you about my experience with bipolar disorder. Um, it's not everybody's experience. People experience this disease in a lot of different ways, but this is just mine. Um, I spend about 80% of my days in uh, a mood state that's somewhere between please stop the screaming in my head right now, I will take anything, uh, or you know, on better days, like, oh, why am I still alive? 5% uh, of my days I spend uh, maybe a little hyper, that's when I go and buy all the shoes and boots uh, that are taking up space in my closet. Um, I also have debilitating panic attacks, um, uh, a kind of delusional hypochondria. Um, I once thought a pill had punctured a hole in my lung and I went to the ER over this. Um, uh, occasional mild hallucinations. Um, I hurt myself, I have scars from cutting, I have self-medicated in all the ways that people can self-medicate. I've been hospitalized four times, once involuntarily. I have had lots of medications uh, and treatments including electroconvulsive therapy and ketamine infusions, which is the new hotness uh, for treating severe depression. Um, it's pretty expensive, time-consuming and exhausting. <laughs> Uh, some days I use up all my spoons just getting to work in the morning. Um, you wouldn't know it, though, would you? Unless I stood up here and told you that this is my daily experience. You can't tell. I look normal enough. I have a job where I'm managing a bunch of product engineers and I'm on call and I make decisions when production systems are down and I pay my taxes and I own property and I'm raising two children. I look fine. That's because I have an invisible disability. And that's not uncommon. So invisible disabilities are chronic illnesses and conditions that significantly impair normal activities of daily living. 96% of people who have chronic medical conditions are not showing outward signs of their illness, and 10% are experiencing symptoms that are considered disabling. So there's a lot of people out there who are struggling with invisible disabilities, and because they're invisible, you don't know it. They're suffering in silence. Um, I already gave the statistics about the number of people in the country who do have bipolar disorder. Uh, and the number who are suffering from mental illness at any given time, and that's just one category of invisible disability. There are a lot of other things, chronic diseases, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases, all kinds of things that you can't tell unless someone tells you. And most of the time in the workplace, people aren't telling you these things, right? 
that's because of stigma. They're, they don't want to reveal this thing, especially in software development, um, in tech. Uh, you, don't want to you don't want to reveal weakness in any way. Um, I think this is really bad for people. It's sad and lonely to suffer in silence. And I also think it's really bad for business. So what this does is if you don't feel comfortable talking about an aspect of your life experience in the workplace, you're covering. So this is uh, from a book by Kenji Yoshino. Uh, he talks about covering as toning down a disfavored identity to fit into the mainstream. All of us are outside the mainstream in one way or another. So this isn't just about people with invisible disabilities. It's not just about people with mental illness. It's not just about people who are under, from underrepresented groups. Um, Deloitte did a study on this, and it turns out that 61% of employees are covering in some way in, in the workplace. Even 45% of cis straight white men are covering something up. So an example might be uh, someone says they're leaving early to go to an off-site meeting uh, because he doesn't want uh, his coworkers to know that he's privileging his children's soccer game over work. Um, other ways people might cover um, uh, choosing not to put pictures of their partners on their desks because they don't want to call attention to their sexual orientation. Um, making up reasons for sick days due to chronic illness. So it's all kinds of ways that people are not really talking about what's going on for them in the workplace. This is bad for productivity. This is not just like a let's be warm and fuzzy at work, um, kumbaya problem. Uh, although, frankly, you know, I think being human in the workplace is really important. But um, there are three big ways that covering is affecting workplace productivity. The first way is that hiding who we are or how we're suffering, it takes a lot of energy. It's sucking energy away from getting actual work done. It doesn't change the reality. It just makes everything worse. So let's say you have like this much energy, like I'm using up this much energy on like managing my bipolar disorder and feeling depressed but somehow getting to work anyway. If I have to like use up additional energy to pretend that everything is okay at work, that's energy I am not pouring into work. I am pouring into hiding in the bathroom crying. So that's completely lost productivity. The second problem is that employees who cover report less job satisfaction. So they're less committed to the organization. They have a lower sense of belonging to the organization. They're demotivated. I spend a lot of time worrying about, worrying about retaining engineers because engineers are really hard to hire. They take a lot of training and you really want to keep the ones you have. Um, I don't want demotivated engineers who are covering in the workplace because they're not going to get as much work done and they're going to leave me when I need them to finish projects. The third big problem from a productivity standpoint is that denying reality results in poor decision making. Not only does covering take up energy, it also means we're all trying to pretend that reality is something other than what it is. If I'm only at 80% capacity because I'm depressed, or I have a team where someone just had a baby and someone's caring for an ailing parent and someone is suffering from uh, PTSD, and I pretend that everybody can give 100%, whatever that means, in the workplace, I'm going to make poor decisions about how much can get done. I'm not changing the reality. It's like if you have to uh, go into a piece of code with a lot of technical debt and you don't have enough time to fix the technical debt, well, you can pretend it's not there but you're not going to get that code written any faster. <laughs> so you may as well not pretend, because when you're pretending, you're making poor decisions. 
So I'd like to argue for less covering and more authenticity in the workplace. I think it's better for people and it's better for business and our society as a whole. I'm going to talk about some barriers to authenticity in the workplace. The first one is thinking feelings are unimportant or inappropriate in the workplace. You see this when people don't really care that employees are upset about a reorg. Um, you see this uh, when people are sh uh, shamed for crying in meetings. Um, I was once told that I expressed too much anxiety about a project that I was working on. I did the project fine, I got it in on time, but I just seemed too anxious about it. Um, this attitude also devalues emotional labor uh, as something that's not very important, um, when in fact emotional labor in the workplace is incredibly important to uh, um, creating a healthy workplace culture. And it's a lot of what good managers are doing. Thinking people's struggles outside of work don't or shouldn't affect their work. So this is the idea that, of course, you have a life outside of work, but when you come to work, you leave all that messy stuff behind. You're just in work mode, and that none of that is affecting you. Um, I think one thing that happens is there's still this assumption in the workplace that there's someone else at home taking care of that messy stuff. So, for example, I saw this once where uh, some people who were not caregivers of children scheduled a really important off-site on a day that all the kids in the city were out of school for some teacher day. You could see like 10 people in a room when they heard about this off-site frantically texting to see if they could get childcare coverage on that day. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a problem. Dominant structures that make people feel anxious and judged. Um, Sally touched on this some, that that's this command and control, you know, where we really, the big boss is the person to look out for um, and impress. And um, that is pretty stressful. <sighs> you get a lot of ranking of people, you get pitting them against one another, and um, top-down hierarchical decisions. This all leads to pressure not to admit weakness. In tech, I think this is like a huge problem. You know, as those of us who are brain workers really don't want to admit weakness about our brains or that we're tired or that things are hard. It makes it hard to own up to mistakes. It makes it hard to apologize. It makes it hard to ask for help. And you're going to end up covering a lot. These four things have something in common. Um, they have patriarchy in common. Our workplaces are patriarchal. They privilege hierarchy, dominance, and competition over collaboration and servant leadership. They value logical thinking and easily measurable labor traditionally associated with men over the emotional and administrative labor that's traditionally associated with women. And despite the massive entry of women into the workplace, there's a continued assumption that the messy work of life is being taken care of by someone else at home. This is not just a problem for people who are not cis men. It causes all of us to have to shrink ourselves down in the place that we're spending the majority of our waking hours and getting much of our sense of value in the world. This is Adrian Rich. The very concept of professionalism, tainted as it is with the separation between personal life and work, with a win or lose mentality, and the gauging of success by public honors and market prices, needs a thorough reevaluation. This is from 1976, and it's a tiny bit depressing to realize that we really still need to do this work. I hope that. This makes sense to you and you're down with us and you're wondering how, how you can have a more authentic workplace where people feel included um, and that you want the productivity gains that come from not having to hide things. Uh, I have some ideas about how you can help. Start where you are. Practice empathy and inclusion in your own team. And you can do this as an individual contributor, as a manager, whatever your job is. You can start doing this. You practice empathy. 
Uh, this is a quote from Brene Brown. Um, I encourage you all to check out her TED Talk uh, that's listed in the resources section. I'm going to skip past this because I'm a little low on time, but it's really about listening and holding space and communicating with others that they matter. So listen with care. This is 90%, I've been in therapy for many, many years. This is 90% of what therapists are doing for you is just listening to you with care. And you can do that for anybody and in whatever role you are. Hey, do you need an ear? The next thing you can do is to share your story. You might not be in a position of power or privilege where you can walk in and be like, hey, I have bipolar disorder, and I'm going to talk about it publicly. That's OK. Like, those of us who are in positions of privilege, it really makes a big difference. I have an appointment with my therapist, so I'm going to miss stand-up tomorrow. My kid was all, all night puking, so I'm having a really hard time focusing today. I feel like I really screwed that up. Again, I don't expect everybody to be in a position to start to share their stories like this, but think about if you are and if there are small ways that you can be open about what's really going on in your life. Build a respectful and inclusive hiring practice. So if you're participating in hiring, that's a huge opportunity to make a difference. Your process should not be stress people out until they break. I know that some tech companies think that is the correct process. Uh, be transparent, kind, and fair. Be authentic when you're interviewing, but understand that your interviewee, ha there's a power differential there, and that they may not be able to be as authentic right back to you. Recognize that struggles and differences bring strength, too. Acknowledge struggles and help others find ways to mitigate them. If you have an invisible disability, you are covered under the Americans with Disability Act, and you can go to HR and ask for reasonable accommodation to help you do your job, but that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is sort of hacking around each other's stuff, just as coworkers and people who care about one another. There are a lot of ways that you can do that. Hey, I get a little scattered when we're in a meeting. Could you please follow up with like to-dos in an email? That's going to make my life easier that kind of helping each other out. You can also vote with your feet. If you're not able to make changes to your culture to make it more authentic and inclusive, you might be able to go somewhere that's got a more welcoming culture. And if you are in a position of really like major market power, you really can do that. Don't go if you can. Don't work for companies that don't respect the basic humanity of their employees. I am going to skip this slide. Um, we are not machines churning out code. We are suffering humans trying to make hard things together. Let's build workplaces that acknowledge that. Thank you. I'll be around. Feel free to contact me on Twitter. I love to talk about this stuff. There's some resources. They're also listed in the booklet. Thank you.